My name is Matt, welcome back to the shop. And today we're gonna to do Hook's Law. Ooh, so this is going to be the start of a suspension. Oops, we'll be if I wrote it properly. Suspension. So this is suspension number one. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do these things in bite-sized bits. And the reason why is if I start blabbering on about um, progressive springs or, I don't know, something, I don't know, energy of springs, etc., etc., I can just say, go to this video, it's really quick, and it just goes through the basics. So there was a guy, I've got it written down here because I can't remember his, the dates. So there's a guy called Rob, it's Robert, but who cares? Hook. And I was reading up about him, and he was born in, let me just get this right, so 1635. And by all accounts, he was a bit of a retard. <laughs> I don't mean like dribbling on the curtains, licking windows retard. I mean, uh, people didn't like him that much. He was a bit of a... Uh, People called him distasteful, um, impatient, snide. People called him all sorts of shit. And, uh, well, of course, he's from the Isle of Wight, so... <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's from the... What is it? Is it Isle of Wight? I think it's the Isle of Wight. Did I write the Isle of Wight down? Yes. Isle of Wight, 1635. Bit of a knob. But... <laughs> he discovered, I've got load, this big list of shit that's written down, but three things that I think are quite um, noteworthy of what old Rob did, was Rob the Knob, was he did, um, he invented, he uh, what's the word, Preposhlated. he basically came up with uh, spring theory, let's just call it spring theory. Right, so this is what we're going to look at, Hook's Law and all that shite. Um, but he also did uh, the tin can, the tin can telephone. So you know how you were pissing around as a kid? He did that seriously. <laughs> uh, tin can, what is it? The shadow graph, which is one of my favourites. Shadow graphs are really, really good. Right. He also did a lot of stuff in my, uh, microscopy etc. Um, and he also, and this is in a sense one of his biggest things, people think about Hook's Law and stuff, one of I think is one of his biggest things, is he discovered the cell. So, you know, under a microscope, he did a lot of jazz with microscopes. There's a big long list of things that he did. There's an even longer list of things that he claimed he did, but didn't, because um, he's a bit of a knob. <laughs> So let's talk about springs. So springs or the functionality or the physical characteristics of just say a spring. So there are many, 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 many different types of springs. Realistically, there's three, right? There are very, you know, there's loads and loads and loads, but there's a compression spring where basically between this helix, and there are many different types of springs, but let's just, let's just stick with some simple stuff. There's a, a compression spring, and basically what it means is that you apply, you compress the spring, so it goes from a larger free length down to a smaller crushed length, um, and you compress that to do that. Then you have expansion springs, like ones on trampolines and shit, usually with a little eyelet on the end, right? And these expansion springs you have to pull apart, right? So you could call them tension springs because you have to put it into tension instead of compression. And then there's what we call torsional springs. And torsional springs are the ones that are like this, like that, or from the side they look like this kind of thing, uh, just think of a clothes peg, right? 
So things, basically torsional springs do torsional forces, but you can kind of almost think of them as torque springs, right? They're springs that deal with forces around a pivotal, pivotal point, so they're torsional springs. Torsional springs, expansion springs, and compression springs. The characteristics of each, are, are, you know, there are differences between them. You know, you're using a different unit measure, or you, you, know, you can use angular measurements, rotation, all that kind of jazz, radians, blah, blah, blah. Uh, expansion springs is tension, which is a bit different when it comes to compression with materials. The forces and stuff aren't different. What's different is, is just, say, how strong or weak a material is. If you'll notice with expansion springs that generally the amount of force that you have to apply is not exactly proportional because of the strength of materials. We'll get into that. Well, actually, no, we won't get into that, but I'm just letting you, trying to make you aware that there is a difference. So, and it's, it's not much of a difference, but there is a difference there. Um, so what he did basically is, there's like the spring formula. What color am I gonna do this in so you can see it? The spring formula, right, or, the force of a spring is equal to k times x. So every time they're just next to each other, there's a little multiplication there. All right, so that's it. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> but like I did before with the wheelie thing, we're gonna label each thing. So the, I the x here, x equals a displacement. Or to the, the common man, how much it moves, how much, all right? That's what a displacement is. So the X is how much the spring has moved. The K is a constant, all right? Constant, I'll just write it like that just for the fun of it. That's what K is. And that is basically, and this is where it gets, we're gonna start going down rabbit hole soon. This is uh, related to stiffness. So this is related to stiffness of the material. All right, so obviously something like a wet noodle, it's really floppy, it's not very really stiff. So this constant would be extremely low. <laughs> Where if you have something like steel, you know, it's a bit stiffer, just a bit, tad bit. Noodles are here, steel's here, and then chalk is also not just hard. Oh. What's going to explode? Chalk is also, if you can you, I don't know if you can hear that. Uh, chalk is not just hard, it's stiff as well. Any rod. Um, and the weirdest thing is, there's also the energy of a spring, which is equal, and this might seem strange, but it's equal to half the K times the displacement squared. And, when you look at that, you go, hang about a minute. Kinetic energy. Energy equals half mv squared. And that little mv is a times in there, right? And I only put them in there just so, if you, if you haven't done maths in forever, or you, you might, can't remember, didn't like maths, hated it, whatever. It's just to jog people's memories, right? So it's there. So kinetic energy of like a, a mass, you know, you throw a ball, a child's head, or anything, javelin, uh, is half mv squared. And then you look at the the spring energy, you know, the energy in the spring is it's half the spring constant, so half the stiffness times the displacement squared. Isn't that strange? That's really weird. <laughs> and this kind of makes sense if you've ever got an expansion spring and pulled it. If you pull it, holy shit, that makes a big difference. So when you let go of it, um, so basically what does all of this nonsense mean? It means once you have a stiffness of a material, so if you have all of the springs just say we're all the same, right? You have the same wire diameter. So, you know, when you have a helical spring, you know, like this, though I hate drawing springs. Uh, It's like that line disappears and that one comes around. Oh, I hate it. 
but whatever. You know, when you go to draw, draw, <laughs> badly draw spring. <laughs> Hate drawing springs. But yeah, badly draw spring. You've got a wire diameter, right? Just see if all of the springs had the same wire diameter, the same major diameter, like this. If all springs were the same, and the stiffness was the same, then basically, all it comes down to is this. The force just equals the displacement. And um, what, what does that mean? Well, that just shows you, right, is it if you have a spring, just say the same spring, so let's just say you've got a suspension spring, you know, and you compress one down to say there, so we'll call that 2x, you know, and we compress this to say 4x. Bloody deal. Like that, right? then it's just twice, it's just twice what that is. So the energy, if you collapse a spring by half, whatever, you know, the force, not the energy, sorry, I shouldn't say that. The force is just equal. So basically it's proportion, it's inversely proportional. So if you make the, the X, the length of the spring smaller than the force that it's pushing back with, Right, because that's what the spring force is. I should really add that. When you have a spring like this, and just say that's that's a solid, immovable object. When you apply a force to here, like this, right, the the FS is going that way. So that's FS, and this is just our force that we're adding. So that could be you pushing it, sticking it in a, a vice, sticking it in bike suspension, you name it. So you apply a force, the, the, the spring force is the force that's pushing back, right? So if you half the spring's length, just say you preloaded every single spring that you do this with, you preload it slightly, if you say that's your zero, half it's, what is it, you know, it's, it's uh, length, then the force will go up. If you then half that again, it goes, proport you know, inversely proportional. As the spring gets smaller, the force gets higher. Now. What that also means is just for a general spring, so a compression spring, that all the coils are the same, right? All the, the, the pitch of the spring is identical. So between each little bit there. With this formula here, there is no, you know, there's no 2x plus four. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing shit like that. There's nothing like that in there. It's just k times x is the, the spring fall, that's it. So it means that there's a linear relationship, right? There's no factor in this, there's no integration, there's no anything. If you compress the spring by double the amount, you'll have double the force pushing back on you. It's as simple as that. What it means is it's a constant rate. Now, people s misunderstand the thing with constant rate. It's like, well, wait there, if it's, just say if it's nine kilograms per metre, right, just say that was your spring rate, right, or newtons, you can write in newtons if you want, you know, I don't know, what would that be, 94 newtons per metre or something, I don't know, whatever it is, <laughs> um, what it means is, is that for every millimetre or every metre or whatever, whatever deviation you want, you know, however you want to chop it up, for every centimetre you compress it, the spring rate is always the same. So let's just say you had a spring that had, I don't know, let's keep it easy, 10 newtons per millimetre, right? That means that you have to apply an additional amount of force of 10 newtons per millimetre. So it's almost like every millimetre you go in, you're, cut, you're resetting. If you want to go, you know, six millimetres, from the free length, then you just times these two together, so it's 10 times six. Let me get my calculator out. <laughs> you know, so that's 60 newtons to collapse it to that point. Um, but it is constant. This number, this, this, you know, this 10 newtons, these 10 newtons per millimeter, right? It's a constant rate, right? It's just a constant rate. That's all you've got to do. And I'm, I'm 
not doing this properly. It's there you go. I should put a line through it. It's 10 newtons per millimeter. So every time you go a millimeter, you have to ad apply an additional 10 newton, uh, 10 newtons. So the best way to think about it is just have a spring sat on some scales and you add just say 10 newtons, which is about a kilo, something like that. So you put a kilogram on it and it just goes down a millimeter. And then you want it to go down another millimeter. You can have to put another 10 on it. You see how it's, it's additive, right? It, the spring rate might be constant, but that doesn't mean it takes just 10 newton meters to collapse the whole thing. It has the displacement and the force required for that displacement is the amount of force you need, which is opposite to that. I hope that makes sense. But basically what Hooke's law is telling us what this is telling us is just that if you have what you'd say call a standard spring, which I will call a standard spring, if you have a standard spring where it has the same pitch, the wire length is the same, the, the wire diameter is the same. So in other words, the stiffness, the stiffness stays the same throughout the system of the spring, then your spring rate will be constant, right? It's basically that simple. Now, Hooke's law actually comes out in loads of other places um, molecular uh, mechanics, so bonds between things, um, grain boundaries, blah, blah, blah. In solid materials, if you get like a, a block of silicon, I had a silicon mould somewhere. You had a block of silicon, you know, or any other materials. You could say even steel, stuff like that. Uh, there's an old saying that basically all of chemistry is electron interaction and all of physics as in would say material physics is all about springs right you know the, the, the amount of force you put into something it pushes back it's very much like a sponge you push with a sponge or you put a certain amount of weight on it collapses you take it off it pushes back or it not collapsing completely to dust that is actually pushing it back so air can loosely behave, loosely, you've got to be careful with air because of the thermodynamic things and all the rest of it. Um, but hydraulics, very similar, um, very similar characteristics. You can use all of these things, anything basically with just kind of like a linear relationship between um, stress and strain. We will do, people asked, they want the stress and strain video, which I think I was always going to do anyway. Now I think about it because we have to kind of just get into people's heads what the word what the word stress and what the word strain means so you know people um don't you know don't get so people aren't constantly asking what does that mean the next thing we're going to look at um so i like to also do these so just in case i have i've met a fuck up or someone doesn't understand or i wasn't very clear um the next thing we're going to cover is harmonic oscillators which then it starts to get a bit more juicy, a bit fun. And that's why you need to understand, that's in a sense why I put this in, right? Just to give you a taste of the kinetic energy, or the, the energy of a spring. It's very similar to kinetic energy. And uh, I might go into reasons why, probably not. It's a bit more physics, a bit more beyond this. Because we want to get to suspension, but in the next one, because of harmonic oscillators, we'll have some springs and we'll have some weights and we'll do some demos just to show you one or two things. We'll then go on to mass damping, stuff like that. And I've got some little cool little experiments, really simple things to show you that kind of bake your noodle a bit. Hope that makes sense and I'll see you in a bit.